it will be available um, later on YouTube and you should be getting an email as well. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn things over first now to Casey Shiley. Good morning, everybody. My name is Casey Shiley, and I am the Florida Library Youth Program Youth Services Consultant. For those who I have not had an opportunity to meet yet, uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. We are really excited to bring you this programming potluck, which was sort of the name that popped in my head the minute I thought about this sort of webinar. Um, and for those who might be new, uh, a couple months back, I put out an all call for anybody who had just a really great program that they love to put on at their library um, and looking for people who wanted to come share. And so that's what we're doing today. Uh, we have several presenters from all across the state, um, which is exciting to bring us um, four di very different programs that hopefully you all can take back to your library and um, either use as is or adapt them to how you might need them. And so first up, I am excited to introduce Lauren, um, who's going to tell us about her character story time. Hello, my name is Lauren Mother, and I'm from the Orange County Library System in Orlando, Florida, and I'm going to present on character story time. Go ahead. Oop, there we go. That's me. Um, feel free to email me after the program if you want any more information, any scripts for the programs or printouts or anything. Let me know. I'm always really happy to share thus doing this presentation. You can also follow me on Twitter. Um, I like to dress up too. <laughs> so what is character story time? Character story time is a series that I do that is highly themed and it surrounds popular characters. So it's an early learning program targeting ages three through five and it's themed around popular TV shows, movies, book series, characters, things that kids are talking about a lot, uh, like Paddington over here or superheroes in the previous picture. It allows children to showcase their knowledge and expertise on something they love. Now it's not a, a program where I show a movie or a clip or anything, everything is done by me and we're allowing the children to kind of celebrate these things that they love and share their knowledge and just show their parents how much they know and also see the library as a place that celebrates the same things that they're excited about. Next one. There we go. Uh, so list of materials for this. I'm not gonna go over a specific program, say like the Raya one I did. I'm gonna do an overview of all of them. And then it's kind of a template so you can create it based on something that you like. And again, if you do wanna do say a Raya one, let me know and I'm happy to send the materials. So the stuff that you'd need for it would be books, obviously, flannel boards or pre-made pre flannel pieces, and then any sort of craft material you'll need for your program. So first you need to select your show or movie as a theme. So you wanna know, you wanna pick something that you're familiar with, something that you know a little bit about, something that's popular, just because if you're kind of celebrating these things, you wanna show that you also have a knowledge of it. So for instance, I've done Frozen several times and I can talk about Anna and Elsa and also the Snow Geese and all of that. Um, you wanna know a lot about this because you're gonna be writing the entire script and um, it's better to know a little bit about it so you're not kind of like in the dark. Um, you also wanna find stuff that has a lot of material and isn't just like a quick one-off. And if you're not familiar with it, obviously familiarize yourself a little bit with it more. So first you need books, obviously. So you wanna find really good books that can be worked into a story time. A lot of time these characters like Paw Patrol and such have golden books, but as we all know, golden books can be extremely long for programs sometimes. You wanna keep your audience's attention, especially if it's virtual right now, all of my programs are virtual. So when showing things, I wanna make sure the books are catchy and short. So I wanna find books that are fun, that I can cut if need be, that tell a story, so for instance, for Frozen, I always do We'll Always Have Each Other, which is from Frozen 2, which is short and very sweet and kind of talks about the changing of seasons. And I can talk about that as well as how things are different, how I'm virtual and not in person. In, in person. You also want to make sure that they have accurate representation. I do mirror royal detective programs, and I don't want to just get any book that might show Indian lifestyle. Um, I typically use uh, a mirror book and then Wheels on the Tuk Tuk, which is shown over there because that's written by Indian authors. I want to make sure that the lifestyle that I'm showcasing is correct to the character, be it her or any other character. 
Um, and then, of course, something that can be worked into a story time. If it's just a counting book, that doesn't work as well sometimes. So something that can be fun, perhaps interactive. Next, your flannels and songs. Now, here's why character story time is different, say, than uh, a color story time or a shark story time. If you want to do a shark story time, you can easily Google shark library story times and get a full script of information. And that's pretty great because librarians love to share, right? As programmers, we want to give people information of what we do. But for something that's like Frozen, due to copyright, you don't see a lot of that often. You can't just Google Frozen story times and get pre-made flannel stories or songs to share. Um, and all of my programs, if they're in person, they're in person, and if they're virtual, we don't record them. So I'm not worried about copyright of stuff. So character story time is unique in that way. So, so are my flannels and songs. However, because I'm not gonna just write a different one each time, um, I use basic songs that a lot of people already know. So some examples of that, if we're doing Five Aliens in a Flying Saucer, instead of doing Aliens in a Flying Saucer, I might do um, Aladdin, and it's Five Good Friends in a Flying Saucer, Zoom Brown, Agrabah One Day, or Daniel Tiger, Five Neighbors in a Rolling Trolley, Zoom Round the Neighborhood One Day. So using these familiar songs, or um, Five Little Ducks Went Out One Day, for Star Wars, I did Five Little Porgs Went Out One Day Beyond the Falcon and Far Away, something like that. Baby Shark was four, uh, Five Little Sharks Went Out One Day Beyond the Reef and Far Away. Um, for Mira, the previous one, I taught them to count to five in Hindi. I used my husband, who is Indian, as, uh, um, to help me with that. So, for instance, one and two, we learned how to say ik do. So, do mongoose went out one day beyond the palace and far away. Um, and then five in the bed, you can do like Paw Patrol, there were five in the bed and Rubble said, or there were five in the sled and Olaf said for Frozen. For a Sailor Went to Sea, I do um, Eric Went to CCC to see what he can CCC and all that he can CCC. And then we go through the Little Mermaid ones. Um, I've done Bluey with the Saints Go Marching, the Healers Go Marching one by one, hurrah, hurrah. So I take all these familiar songs that the kids might have heard already and just use their characters. And with that, I'm able to hold up the picture of Bluey and say, who is this? And then they can tell me it's Bluey or hold up these flannels that you can see right here and they can tell me which one's Baby Shark, Mama Shark, Daddy Shark, et cetera. So they're super excited about it and they can kind of start singing along once they learn the first verse. So I make all of my songs and flannels predominantly based off of these things they're already familiar with. And then, of course, there has to be games and activities because I like my things to be interactive. So I'll start my program with a book. We'll go into a flannel or a song where we can sing about the characters and we can hold up the pictures and have the kids tell us who they are. I'll also ask questions like, this is Chase. What, what color is his shirt? And that's a good way for them to yell out, it's blue. Or um, what does Chase always say when he's ready to go with the Paw Patrol? And then inevitably someone will yell out, Chase is on the case. So they're showing you that they're excited. They're showing their parents that they know and their parents are like, okay, all of this, these books and TV shows that they watch are paying off because they're smart little kids. Um, so after flannels and stuff, we do games and activities that kind of make it more interactive. So uh, for instance, I wrote Moana Run here. So what I do for that is I do it kind of like a video game where I say, okay, everyone stand up. Let's pretend we're on the boat with Moana, right? We're on our canoe and we grabbed our paddle and we're paddling. So they all have to move their hands like they're paddling. And then, oh no, the Kakamora are throwing things at us. We have to duck. So we all duck together. Or uh, Taka came and there's fire, we need to jump off our boat. And we jump and we paddle and we run and it gets them more working and running and getting a lot of energy out and makes them feel part of the, the show. Um, so we do that with Moana, with Aladdin, we've been on the magic carpet going in and out uh, with Tiana and Princess and the Frog, we were in the bayou and we had to get away from the frog chasers. So all of that is a way to get them into the, the program, into the mindset of this and make it super interactive. And then I also have stations where they can interact with things. So for instance, with Paw Patrol stations, Rocky's the recycling pup, right? So you have to go to his station and just grab a bunch of the random stuff I have set up and recycle it and turn it into something else. So it gets them thinking like the pup, it gets them thinking like Moana and kind of puts them in this, this mindset. Um, again, some of this isn't as, uh, the stations aren't as 
doable virtually, but the mo the, the running thing does. I do that very frequently in all of my program. We just did a Vivo one and um, we went through the Everglades. So that's a fun way to do virtually. And then crafts. So we'll have a, you know, we'll have, I usually do about two books. I'll do several flannels and songs and then interactive activities and then the craft. So the craft, I like to be part of the character. So again, we're continuing this theme of reading about, singing about, going into it, and now you're you're a part of it with your craft. So we'll make lightsabers for Jedis. When I did Star Wars Story Time, we did Mira's notebook. So then we were also on the case and we can go find all the clues. Uh, when I did Muppet Babies, we did Fozzie or Piggy's microphone, which was I did after holiday time, so I was able to get uh, ornaments very cheap to make microphones. Um, we'll do science and make snow for Elsa. We did Doc's stethoscope for Doc McStuffins. Anything like that, which makes them part of it. Again, I just did Vivo, so we did Vivo's drum so they can bounce the beat of their own drum um, and all of that. So I, I find ways for them to be, to be fully ingrained in this program and celebrate this character that they know so much about. The outcome. Um, outcomes are always important. A character story times have become extremely popular for me with an average of about 50 Zoom logins or in person I had 40 plus children. Um, just seeing like Paw Patrol story time gets kids excited. It gets them excited to come into a library because they see it familiar there and then they're excited to share with you their knowledge so they can find you as someone who's trustworthy, who's someone who's not scary as an adult who also shares the same passion. And even even if you don't know all about Blue's Clues and You or something like that, as long as you know a little bit about it, you can also talk to them about, yeah, Blue finds, hides three clues and, you know, all of that. Um, and kids love showcasing their knowledge and sharing what they know about these characters. A lot of times they'll dress up for the programs, they'll bring toys. Zoom's been great for that. They'll hand, hold up all of their little toys. And while for my Zoom programs, I don't, I keep all the kids muted because with 50 Zoom logins, that could be a lot of people uh, chatting at once, especially three-year-olds. Um, I do make it interactive where I'll be like, okay, so if you have something of, of Frozen, feel free to hold it up and show me. And then I'll go down and, and be like, okay, Angela, that's a really beautiful Elsa doll or, you know, whatever like that, or something more broad. Like, if it's Paw Patrol, if you have a Paw Patrol toy, feel free to show it. But if you don't, that's perfectly fine. Do you have another show, toy you want to show me? I would love to see all of your toys. So I make it interactive or that way where they can see, be, feel seen, but they don't necessarily have to have the toy because I know not every family buys all of these toys. So I have them show me whatever they want and then I give it time to be able to like talk to, not necessarily talk to them, but talk at them and say, I see you, I see that you love it. That's an awesome costume, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been a really fun way to be interactive with them and still let them show me what they, what they like. And then, um, like I said, even virtually, children show up, they want to discuss this uh, topic, and you can see parents are proud. I've gotten a lot of reactions from parents, both in person and virtually, that they're excited by this because they see how excited their kid is. They see how into it their kid is. And that is extremely rewarding to me that they liked it and that we're learning counting with, with uh, Bluey or we're learning or letters with Sesame Street. Sesame Street's one of my more popular one. We'll do, I do that one weekly where we do a different letter. So if they're learning that E stands for Elmo and also elbow, that's, that's amazing to me. And then, um, yep, some challenges. Every program does have a challenge, right? Um, like I said, these things, because of copyright, you can't just find them anywhere. So everything must be created from scratch. So it does take time for each program. But like I said, I usually have a basic outline that I'm going by. And then I just kind of like pick and choose different songs to use and different interactive elements based on what it is. Um, and then I come up with all the, the, the crafts and stuff. Finding good books also becomes an issue sometimes because there, there are so many books based on these characters. They're, like I said, sometimes too long or they're just not great for story time. You wanna tell a good story, right? So I, I try to find the best ones. I cut when I can. And like with Mira, I'll throw in a book that might be similar. For Frozen, I could throw in a snowman book or something like that. I always want to do at least one that has the character in it. But I can also veer and recommend them another book that I might like. 
that might not be of the character, which kind of gets them into a different type of book, which is also exciting. And it is important to be familiar with the show. You want to know your base level knowledge. The first time I tried this was many years ago, and I tried with Sophia the first, and I did not know Sophia the first, and the kids called me out on that because I didn't know her, one of the, the dad's name or something. So since then, uh, I've become very familiar, and I am very fortunate to have two daughters who are obsessed with Bluey and so many other things. So I can use them to know kind of what's popular, but I also see what kids are checking out at the library. And it's not hard to just check out an episode of, of something or, you know, read the books, do a Google search, go to the official website and learn a little bit about it. So these are, these are my character story times. Like I said, I'm very passionate about it and I've had great reactions. So I really love passing it along. So again, my name is Lauren Mother. I'm with the Orange County Library System. And if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand. I'm here for that. Um, but also feel free to email me and I'm happy to share any of these scripts, send them to you, um, what, whatever you'd like. I'm happy to pass along these because I'd love them to be popular for you as well. <laughs> so uh, I'm a fast talker, but thank you so much for listening to me. I had a lot of fun um, and have a great presentation. Enjoy the rest of the programs. They're all awesome. Thank you so much, Lauren. I, you know, I, I love any time I go to a webinar and it involves somebody singing to me. Um, you know, I, I feel like in the, in the world of children and youth services, that's always a win. Um, and I too have kids who are very obsessed with some of these characters and I know how excited they get when they see those characters that they know. Um, does anybody have any questions for Lauren before we move on to Carrie? Again, you can hit that hand raise button and we can unmute you or you can throw it in the chat. And if you have a question come up later, um, we'll have another time at the very, very end where you can come back to uh, Lauren or any of the other presenters, but feel free to ask questions along the way. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Carrie. Hello, my name is Carrie Peters, and I'm a library associate at Landa Lakes Library in Pasco County, Florida. I've worked in libraries for about seven years, and I've been in my current position in the youth services for about four years. Um, I do programs for toddlers, preschoolers, K through five, and preteens, but my favorite age group is K through five. So I'm presenting today on Around the World, um, which is our cultural program. It explores the aspects of different countries from art and language to music and food. Um, the children are introduced to these through traditional crafts, food, music, language, games, and activities. So um, I think the first thing that we always do is, uh, usually maybe the hardest part is choosing our countries. So there's several different ways that we choose our countries. Um, the first way is by coordinating um, with holidays. So that does make it easier um, because it gives you a lot of choices. Um, for example, um, we chose for March to do Ireland because that would coordinate with St. Patrick's Day. And in January, we chose to do China because that coordinated with Chinese New Year. Um, so those were always fun um, and we could do our decorations and, you know, have all the traditional foods and it really worked out well. So the other way we chose countries is just by kind of randomly um, closing our eyes, spinning the globe, and just put our finger on the globe and see where our finger lands. So it's kind of a random way, but it's fun. So, and if you land in the middle of the ocean, just choose the closest country or spin again. Um, you could also poll patrons to find out what countries they would like to learn about. We try to mix things up by spreading things out between all the continents. Um, and also our staff helped by uh, helping choose food um, and activities and everything. Um, so for example, one of our uh, staff members had Egyptian heritage, and so she gave us recommendations for food. We had some yummy pitas and hummus, and um, she also taught us to belly dance, which is really, really fun. Um, and then the last way we um, will choose is we did have some patron requests. So um, we had a family that was from South Korea, and so we did a program on South Korea, and we enlisted their help, and it was really a great learning experience for all of us.
So the first thing we would do um, during the program is our passport and we would the kids would get their passport stamped and write down useful words and phrases and their favorite parts of the destination once the program was over. So for stamps, we just use little symbols of the country like a thistle for Scotland and the Eiffel Tower for France. So just something related to the culture of the country. And so that was fun to actually, you know, begin the program by getting their passport stamped. So um, I have kind of a rough outline of the program components. Um, I'm going to give an overview first and then go uh, into detail on each one. So first for language, um, children would learn how to say and write common phrases like hello, goodbye, and thank you. And sometimes we did add a few extra. For music and dance, um, we played some background music and um, actually showed them some videos of music and dancing. And that was really fun for them. And games, we did uh, teach the kids some traditional games and that's a fun way for them to learn about culture. The next component is food. So they sampled some authentic foods and it gave them a taste of each country. And of course, crafts, um, creating arts and crafts is a favorite of a lot of kids and it does improve the fine motor skills and cultural awareness. So that was always something um, that we included in every single program. So going into detail a little bit about our language, how to say, as you can see, we had some um, little graphics that that we put in, a, we uh, put out on the table with, near the passports so the kids could copy down the hello, goodbye, and thank you and practice pronouncing them. As you can see, we did include the pronunciations. So that was also a good intro to the program. And going along with the language, um, we greeted the children in the traditional greeting. So for example, when we did Kenya, um, we would say Jumbo when they entered the room. And when we uh, did our passport to France, we would say bonjour. So that was a good welcome for them. And of course, uh, for some of the languages where we could, we did add extra words and phrases. And that was also fun to go a little bit beyond the basic. All right, and next was the food. And the food, it, it wouldn't be in around the world without food. And it's something that we've done for every single program. Um, the funnest part was kind of sourcing the food and seeing um, what we could get and kind of how we could make it um, more kid friendly. So um, first to pay for the food, um, we relied a lot on Friends of the Library funds. We have a really, really good Friends of the Library group who helped us out tremendously. And we did solicit some donations. Um, Publix did send some gift cards for a few programs as well as um, a local restaurant called Pizza Villa donated some platters of food for our passport to Greece. So as you can see here, there is many yummy little desserts. There's baklava there and some different little cookies and pastries. So they were a big hit. And it also does allow for kids to try out different things that they would not normally try at home. For example, I had never had the tomatoes with cumin and sea salt and they were delicious and the pitas and hummus were also a hit. Um, that was for a passport to Egypt. And then for a passport to Peru, we gave the kids samples of arroz con leche, which is rice pudding, and is now one of my favorites. So that was a really popular one. So moving on to the next component that we would always include was music. So we played background music in most of our programs to uh, make the atmosphere more authentic, kind of like they were actually going to the country instead of the children's room in the library. So uh, some examples where we played some Celtic music um, and the African music was a big hit also because the children actually for their craft made their own drums and would drum along to the music. So that was really fun, a little bit loud, but really fun. So we sourced our music from a few different places. Um, we did have some CDs in our personal collections and in our library collection. So we did, did use those. We also used Hoopla Digital, which is a service that our library subscribes to. It is really wonderful and it has pretty much any type of music you could um, 
imagine. So definitely look into that if you do not um, have Hoopla Digital at your library system. You may want to um, look into uh, subscribing. And then thirdly, we um, did some YouTube videos, um, primarily so that they could see some examples of Irish dancing or Bollywood dancing. And it was really fun. And, you know, we would just um, a lot of the kids would actually sit down, you know, in a little circle near the TV and just watch. And some would try to do the dancing. So that was really entertaining. And moving on to um, we do try to incorporate some STEM into all of our programs. So one of the best ways was uh, using our uh, landmark building challenges. So we did the Taj Mahal where we used uh, pre-cut white styrofoam pieces and they would try to build the Taj Mahal from the picture provided. We did the Great Pyramids of Egypt where we used some wooden blocks. And pictured here is Braun Castle, which is also known as Dracula's Castle in Romania, which we held in October to coordinate with spooky season. So that was really fun trying to build that. And we had some interesting information about Dracula as well for that program. And of course, none of our programs would be complete without crafts. So kids love hands-on fun. So we did for Passport to Peru, for example, we did a collaborative weaving project. So basically the kids would take turns on um, doing a few lines on the loom. And we ended up with a beautiful product, as you can see. And after this, we um, heard a wonderful folktale from Peru. And we do try to put folktales in many of our programs. So um, as you can see for Peru, we also did a llama craft, which turned out really cute, and a Scottish thistle craft at our passport to Scotland. And of course, we're, we're always having fun in the children's room. So we tried to do different games for each country. And of course, for Scotland, we had to do golf, which is the national game of Scotland. And incorporating movement, um, gets kids more involved. And of course we did our programs after school. So, you know, they were ready to uh, unleash their energy and play some games. And as you can see, we made a Scottish castle for one of our putt-putt challenges and um, a Highland coo over here, a cow, but it's called a coo. So that was really fun to make and watch the kids play. Now, one of our last uh, things that we did was um, we got in contact with FLAG, which is an acronym for Foreign Links Around the Globe. And this is an organization that exchange, did the, uh, match exchange students with local families. So a representative had attended many of our programs and helped the children play a fun flag matching game. She would let them all you know, look at the board and, and study the flags for a moment and then turn them all over and see if they could match the correct country with its flag. And of course, it was a very popular station. Uh, she gave lollipops as rewards for playing. So if you can find a cultural organization in your area or even um, a, uh, a section of flag, that would be um, a really good thing to try. So we like to make our um, programs a little bit um, extensive as far as including all the elements, especially reading. So we did put out always um, a special display table of books that go along with the theme of the program. So for example, we will put out books um, and all books, um, including easy books, chapter books, nonfiction, everything that we could find on the theme, as well as a globe and some maps that our kids could check out. Um, on the map, we would always make sure we marked the country and we also marked where we are in Florida so that the kids could see just how far away the country was on the globe and get some perspective. So that was really fun. And um, on along that vein, when we did have to switch to kits um, when COVID came along, um, we actually did book bundles. So we would send a few books home like maybe one nonfiction and one easy book or one chapter book, depending on the age of the child. And so this would kind of go along with the 
literacy and encourage them to learn more and read more. We also included recipes, obviously, since we couldn't do food. So some recipes that they could um, try at home in the kits that we've assembled. So this is what we've done for our cultural programs, but I would love to hear about and see photos of yours and hear any ideas you might have. So of course, feel free to reach out to me at Carrie P at Pasco Libraries org. And thank you for attending. Thank you so much, Carrie. Looking at all those pictures of food um, has me ready to eat. <laughs> <laughs> and as a tomato tomato lover, I need to try the, the cumin and salt and see what that is, what that's like. Yes, it's a very yummy spice. I hadn't <laughs> tried it myself prior to that. So it's good an opportunity for all. It is. Does anybody have any questions for Carrie before we uh, turn it over to Alex? Again, you can put up that hand raise button or put it in the chat and then we will also revisit questions later on if we need to. Well then Alex, take it away. Hi everybody, thank you so much um, for joining me today. My name is Alex, um, short for Alexandra Phillips. I am the Assistant Branch Manager and Youth Services Librarian um, here at the St. Johns County Public Library System located in beautiful St. Augustine, Florida. Um, please reach out if you have any questions about anything I'm about to talk about. Um, and I'm so excited to be included, especially with all of these amazing program ideas we've heard about so far. So thank you. Okay, um, this summer we did a really fun self-directed program called Pokemon at the Pond. Uh, we have this great pond that's out in front of um, our library branch with a sidewalk going all around it. We've been wanting to do a story walk program for a long time. Um, but just have never gotten around to it so far um, and wanted to try a program that was inspired by it but didn't necessarily take the commitment or the um, the budget that a story walk program would initially um, so we happened to have these pokemon cutouts already from a different program um, another coworker was doing with anime club um, she made all of these um, we'll get into how she made them in just a few minutes but we set them up around our pond um, and did a little who's that Pokemon game um, it was so much fun uh, I loved that it brought together families and different generations um, who would come to the library walk outside um, and also come in uh, there was absolutely no tech required. I know a lot of people um, play Pokemon Go um, and they're familiar with that or like the video games. Um, but we were we were happy that we could offer a no tech um, version of Pokemon for them to play. We also did random prize drawings. Um, for the, uh, the logs that we incorporated into the program. Um, so we did a, a drawing from each week that people participated and just some little prizes, um, like some um, pop poppets, excuse me, um, that were Pokemon themed and some other little toys that we already had. Okay, um, the Pokemon are really not hard at all to make. Um, we used a projector. Um, and projected the image of the Pokemon or the silhouette um, onto poster board. Um, we painted them um, with black paint, but of course, if you um, if you wanted to just use maybe a, a white colored pencil or something um, on top of black, that would save some time, of course. Uh, we laminated all of them so that they would last longer. Uh, and we played around with different kinds of stakes. So initially we used, as you can see in this photo here, we used some wooden stakes um, and we just taped um, the Pokemon to them on the back. Um, but then <laughs> we found some recycled yard signs. Um, so um, my coworker spray painted them um, and we were able to just tape the Pokemon on there um, and take them out each day. 
um, for the program. So that worked out really well and was much easier to put into the ground. Um, of course, you may also need some prizes if you decide to incorporate that part of the, um, of the program as well. So the way we did the program um, was we had enough Pokemon um, that we offered um, a different selection each week because we wanted to encourage them to keep coming back to the library every week during the summer um, and take part in this program so they could guess who the Pokemon was for each and every week. Um, so first up is deciding on what Pokemon you're going to do, what the rotation is going to be, um, and then of course making them. So we were able to skip that since we already had them from a different program, but they're not difficult, very inexpensive to make. Um, cut them out, laminate if desired, which I would highly recommend. Okay, tape to stakes or boards, determine the schedule for what you're going to do so that you don't repeat your Pokemon like I did a few times. Whoops! Um, and then create signage and handouts. On the, uh, the photo on the right hand side there is the log that I used. Um, I created it in Canva uh, and used an image of a Pokedex. Um, and then put in my own information. There's space for them to write down their name and phone number, um, and also space on the right-hand side for them to write down uh, which Pokemon they think are out there this week. So I would have them come into the library, pick it up, fill it out outside, drop it back off inside, and at the end of each week, I would, um, would pull them um, and pull a prize winner. I love that this program would be so customizable with other themes, especially pop culture. Um, so if you want to adapt it to your own, um, that would be amazing. Maybe some of those characters that Lauren was talking about in her presentation um, put together some kind of self-directed outside program. So we had about 52 logs returned between June and July, uh, and we did start to see the same families returning week after week. Um, we had parents, we had grandparents, um, we had kids of all ages that were so excited to come and, and interact with us. Um, there was one little girl, she had to be like three or four, um, who wanted to take part in it. And her mom was saying, are you sure you know what Pokemon are? And she's like, yeah, of course. I know Pokemon. I know Pikachu, Baby Yoda. It was the cutest thing. Um, the kids also checked out a lot of our um, our Pokemon books and, and Pokedexes to go outside with them. Um, there were a few who came up and asked me, you know, is it is it okay if I take this outside? Is that cheating? I said, no, no, please <laughs> use whatever resources are available to you to guess who the Pokemon are. So I loved that. It was very sweet of them to ask. There were some challenges um, that we worked through. That was mostly communicating um, the schedule, responsibilities, and instructions to um, our front-facing staff and trying to remember whose job it was to put them out each day um, because over the summer um, we were very short-staffed and not all of us were here at all times. Um, Due to Florida's weather, we decided to only put out our Pokemon from 10 to 12 um, each day that we are open. Uh, so there was also a lot of, of weather checking and just trying to remember to put them out and then run out and get them when it's time. Um, so it's something as simple as, you know, just writing everything out and setting a reminder on your phone or, or in the email, in Outlook, excuse me. Um, to, to retrieve those materials would be good. And since we're gonna be doing it again next summer, that is exactly what we will be doing. Okay, I did put together some resources for you so that if you want to do this program, you don't have to start from scratch at all. Um, so I'm going to just pop over to that real quick to show you. Oops, there we go, whoopsie. Um, okay. So I put together a short URL, bit.ly slash Pokemon Pond, um, and you can see um, the photos that were included, um, the flyers, the templates that we used. I also included um, a Canva link um, to these templates. So if you would like to open those up, um, save them to your own Canva account and edit them, you definitely can. 
so you can customize them to your own library. I also included a link in the slides to um, our library Instagram account where we often post about our programs. We're pretty active on there too. So that is, that is it from me. Thank you all so much um, for allowing me to present on this. Um, Alex, we got a question from Allison. It says, would you mind explaining how you projected Pokemon images onto the poster board? Oh, sure. Yes. Um, so we just set up our, our like old school projector um, that we use for, for mo showing movies here at the library. Um, we connected it to um, just a laptop with the, the image of the Pokemon on there um, and projected it onto white um, poster board, um, sketched it out with pencil and then painted it in with the black paint. Oh, great. Okay. We've also done the same thing um, to project like the, the Death Star when we did Star Wars Reads Day. It was really, really fun. Wonderful. There's a lot of, um, this sounds great. Thank you for the, the links. Um, and just a reminder to everybody, um, I will be sending out the PowerPoint so you will have access to everybody's contact information and the links. Um, so you will be able to access those later. Um, Catherine did say, I think I'll be using our Cricut much easier. Um, Roseanne did ask, was copyright clearance sought for use of the images? No, I did, I did not do that, no, because this was, well, this was just a small um, in-house self-directed program that we did, um, so I did not go that far. Any other questions? We've got one more set of presenters coming up. Um, and we're looking pretty good on time. We should finish right around time. Um, so again, any questions that come up, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and so next, I am happy to introduce Casey and Stevie. And they are gonna talk to us about their Reading in a Winterland program. Can you guys hear us okay? Yes, and I can see your PowerPoint. Perfect. Yay! Because <laughs> that wasn't the whole morning of crazy. All right. So uh, my name is Stevie Thomas. I'm the Youth Services Coordinator for the West Florida Public Library System in Pensacola, Florida. This is me having fun at the Panhandle Equine Rescue in Cantonment. Um, with me today, and the person that's going to be primarily doing this in this presentation is Casey Voigt. Uh, she's one of my youth services librarians at the main library. Um, she is pictured with Sugar, a cute little goat that we did um, Tales and Tales programs with uh, this past summer. All right. She's going to talk to you about reading in a winter wonderland. I was basically the great enabler for this project, uh, so she's going to take it away. All righty. So what it was. Reading in a Winter Wonderland was an activity-based reading challenge. It consisted of 25 activities that included reading in certain ways and reading certain types of books. We hosted our winter challenge in Beanstack, which for those of you who don't use it, is an app or a website that you can use to host reading challenges. The reading activities for Reading in a Winter Wonderland were organized into a bingo card. The idea was that patrons could complete activities to win bingos and then receive a prize for each bingo. And while there are more than five bingos possible in a bingo card, we decided five prizes was more than enough. In addition to receiving a prize for every bingo completed, patrons received raffle tickets to enter in to win grand prizes. The challenge ran from Friday, December 18th, which was the beginning of the school district's winter break, to Sunday, January 31st. And who it was for, it was for everyone. When coming up with the activities for the challenge, we tried to use ones that could be completed by people of all ages. We also tried to stay away from activities like read to a sibling or read to a grandparent to make it all inclusive. We did divide the challenge into age groups for prize purposes, and while the 0 to 17 crowd all had the same bingo prizes, there were different grand prizes for each age group. So this is what the challenge bingo card looked like. 
16 of the activities were reading related activities like read under the covers, read in your pajamas and make your own bookmark. And the other nine activities were to read certain types of books like read a book about winter or a book about a holiday you don't celebrate. This is what the challenge looked like in Beanstack. We used the pre-existing Beanstack badges and tried to find ones that would fit with the activity, like a snowy owl for reading a book older than you, because owls are a symbol for being wise, and as they say, older is wiser. Um, this year we created our own badges for the challenge just to make it easier. This is what the bingo badges look like. We ultimately decided to make them all the same because they were all the same activity, like completing a bingo. We did set it so that the complete 10 activities badge was locked until the complete five activities badge was completed. And then the same for the 15, 20, and 25s. So they couldn't shoot straight to the big prize. This is what the bingo badges look like. The patron had to enter the five activities that they completed for each bingo. We didn't go through and make sure that they were all different activities. We kind of approached it with the honor system. When they completed a bingo, they got a notification that they had a prize waiting for them. And this is just the message that popped up for the youth participants when they completed their fifth and final bingo. So for supplies, obviously we use Beanstack to run the challenge. Um, we have an annual subscription to Beanstack, so we do have to pay for it year-round. And we typically only used it for summer, so we wanted to kind of get more use out of it, which is why we started our winter reading challenge. Prizes were definitely the biggest part of the challenge because patrons received a prize for each bingo that they completed as well as grand prizes that they could enter in to win. The bingo prizes were tiered so they got slightly larger for each bingo and we were lucky enough to have several prizes for all ages left over from summer 2020 so we reused a lot of those. Um, the theory was that even if a patron participated in both the summer and winter challenge with the raffle they were getting to pick which prize they had a chance of winning. We had a total budget of $500 and we actually ended up under budget because we reused so much leftover summer 2020 stuff, including prize books and grand prizes and treasure chest items. These were the tiered prizes for youth. Like I mentioned, they got slightly bigger for each bingo. And these are the tiered adult prizes. For the tiered bingo prizes, we prepared for about 100 youth participants and 50 adult participants. We did end up with quite a bit left over and we've just been using them for other programs throughout the year. These were the grand prizes we had, again, all left over from summer of 2020. So how we did it. The first step was figuring out when to run the challenge. We chose to have it start at the beginning of the school's winter break and then run through the end of January to give them enough time to complete the challenge. Then we chose the activities to include. Like I mentioned earlier, we tried to make the activities all inclusive. Next was picking the prizes and how we would distribute them. Most of our prizes were leftovers, which made choosing it quite a bit easier. And then I just went through the Oriental Trading Clearance and Sales section and tried to find prizes that would work for multiple age groups. We ultimately decided on the tiered prize level, so again, they got slightly bigger with each bingo. Next was building the challenge in Beanstack, which was very time consuming. But if you have all the pieces ready before you start, it's pretty easy because it's just plugging the information in. Um, it seems obvious, but definitely have at least one person look over your work, probably more, because it's very easy to miss stuff when you're putting that much information in. And then lastly, we promoted the challenge. We were lucky enough to have a designated library marketing person who handled making the flyers, advertising the event on our website and all of our social media, and doing all that fun jazz. For the outcome, we had a total of 169 registrants. 119 of those actually completed activities in the challenge. The 119 active participants completed a total of 3,296 activities, and each participant could have completed 31 activities. 344 rewards were earned, but only 223 were claimed, and that may have been a recording issue because several staff members at our branches weren't marking the prizes as redeemed in Beanstack because they weren't sure if they had to or not. And 27 people completed the whole challenge, and that's all 31 activities. Some of the challenges we faced. The biggest challenge was choosing which activities to include. We didn't want to create multiple challenges, so we needed one that would work for everyone. Choosing the prizes and the prize distribution was also really challenging, again, because we needed prizes that would work for multiple age groups. And the last challenge we faced was building the challenge in Beanstack. There are a lot of details that go into building a challenge from scratch, 
which is why it's so important to have someone else check your work. Things can easily be left out or forgotten. Um, for additional resources, this is the link to the event description on our website and then the downloadable bingo card that we made available. And that's all I got for you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions for Casey or Stevie before we wrap up or any of the other other presenters? I do know that um, Lauren had to leave um, unexpectedly. And we also have up on the screen everybody's contact information if you want to reach out to somebody individually and follow up with them. And again, um, if you have a question, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you or you can put it in the chat. I love that um, since so many libraries, you know, who are using Beanstalk and Read Squared, since, you know, you typically have to have that year long. I, I love that you found a way to really use it more than just for summer so that you're really getting more out of that, that program as well. No questions? All right. Well, thank you to all of my presenters for spending the time and the effort to come together and um, help us put this webinar together. Um, I hope to do more of these in the future. So for those of you who um, we're in here listening, you know, think about some of the programs that you do at your library and if you have something that's particularly unique, um, something that your library really loves to do, we would love to feature it in future versions of these. Um, I know that programming resources are something that everybody is always looking for. And so um, I'm glad that we could provide an opportunity for some of your colleagues to come share some of their ideas. So I hope that you're able to take some of these back to your library and either use them as is or adapt them um, to fit your your needs. Um, in the next day or so, you should see the email come through with the video recording as well as all of the materials and resources. So thank you so much, everybody, and you have a wonderful weekend, and we will see you online next time. <laughs>